Master, give the blessing. Wisdom. What you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators, and all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Glory to Jesus Christ glory forever. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent uh, by St. John Climacus. And for quite a few weeks now, we've been making our way through step number 26 on discernment. And uh, we're coming towards the end of it, uh, except he's going to offer us a little summary uh, for the last five or six pages. So we still it's we still have a good bit to get through here, uh, but his style is definitely going to change for for those where he's just sort of giving us little bullet points as an aid to help us um, have a greater insight, I think, into the nature of discernment and the uh, the various virtues that are important in maintaining it. So we are picking up on page two hundred fifteen this evening, at the bottom of the page one eighty five. We should not be dismayed if we find that we are more passionate at the outset of our monastic life than we were in our life in the world. We have to remove the causes of sickness, and then health will come to us. The beasts were there and hiding all the time, only they did not show themselves. And so often when someone enters into a monastery, they are filled with zeal, uh, hopeful about what is to come, and the order of the life, the, the common prayer, uh, all the things that uh, they might romanticize in their own mind. But not long after being there for uh, a while, they could come to hate the place and wonder why they're uh, drawn there altogether, because they find themselves afflicted you know, uh, either not able to pray or certain passions arising from the heart and afflicting them on a daily basis. Or maybe they have a dislike or resentment towards members of the community. So they find themselves struggling in greater measure in the monastery than they did in the world. And uh, so John wants them to understand, his readers to understand, that this is something normal, that when one enters into the spiritual life with greater depth, either through a commitment uh, such as uh, becoming a monk, or it would be true also becoming a priest or married or embracing any particular vocation that involves uh, greater cult holiness uh, or specific path, that often the demons will seek to undermine and undermine that commitment. And, uh, and even if it's simply a commitment to enter into the spiritual life in a deeper fashion, people often find uh, at the beginning of Lent, when they begin to take up the, the greater disciplines, all of a sudden struggling more with particular passions uh, to, in some ways, uh, uh, draw them away from uh, their greater disciplines. And um, and so we should expect this uh, that uh, and not become discouraged by it. We've talked many times before that one in, when one engages in warfare, one is going to be warred against. And so uh, when you enter into the monastery, the 
the illnesses, the passions might manifest themselves to, in a greater measure. The, and they remained hidden in the world where perhaps one could be distracted by other things, not be as attentive to the spiritual life. Uh, but then once one begins, even in the smallest measure, to be attentive to what's going on within, uh, we can become aware of just what passions have a hold on us and how deep that can be or how easily we slip into resentment uh, or anger or how we're overcome by uh, certain lustful thoughts or by gluttony. Uh, there's a famous painting that somebody uh, made uh, for one of the guest rooms at Mount Athos called The Secret Eater. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it. If You, you should look it up online. Uh, it's a terrifying painting, but uh, uh, monks who often would struggle with the, you know, uh, abstinence rules and the fasting and uh, often would become secret eaters so sneak into the refectory at night uh, in order to eat extra food uh, and there was an individual a monk who was doing that and was overcome by demon and the you know the monks came in when he was in the grip uh, of these demons uh, so it's a very interesting painting it's not an icon but uh, nonetheless uh, i think you'd find it fascinating when by some accident, he goes on to say, those who are otherwise approaching perfection are overcome by the demons in a trivial matter, they should at once use every device in their power to wrench this fault out of them again, a hundred times over. Isn't that interesting? So as one has progressed in the spiritual life and moved toward perfection, when you see yourself being overcome by something that might seem slight to others, that your response should not be to treat, treat it as trivial, but rather to really seek to uproot it uh, and to uh, do violence to the self in the sense of fasting, engaging in a particular penances uh, in order that one might not backslide that often it is through what seem to be trivial issues, seem to be small things, that the, the demon will foster a kind of indolence, slackness, negligence within us, uh, in order then to open us up to, to greater trials. And so never to consider something like this as light, not to create anxiety within us, but uh, John is talking about the necessity of, of in driving out the demons as quickly and as fiercely as possible and uh, not, not to dally with them, in other words. Number 187, <clears throat> as the winds in calm weather ruffle only the surface of the sea, but at other times they stir the depths as well. So you can imagine to yourself the dark winds of iniquity for in those enslaved by passions, they shake the actual consciousness of the heart. But in those who have already made progress, they only ruffle the surface of the mind. That is why the latter soon fill their normal calm, for the heart was left undefiled. So for those who are living in the depths, so they they're, have a kind of constancy of prayer, they've uprooted the passions, uh, when the storms arise, they aren't going to necessarily feel them like a person who's beginning in the spiritual life, where when those blend, winds blow, they can really rattle the person and shake them at the depths of their consciousness. And, uh, and so on one level, it gives us a sense of one's progression in the spiritual life, how to read uh, what is going on. And... Uh, and so one who's made greater progress isn't undone by those things. We'll do what is necessary and turn one's attention to God. Whereas a, a person who's shaken to the, the depths of their consciousness uh, is going to be maybe thrown out of their spiritual life altogether or thrown into a kind of despondency or sadness about this. 
uh, as we move forward, both in the, uh, the Abergatino Senate here, we see despondency really being a very serious struggle in the spiritual life, that uh, this kind of spiritual sadness that overcomes us can make it difficult to persevere in the spiritual life, where we feel beaten down or shell-shocked, as it were, by the passions and their how they afflict us or the number of times that we fall and have to, in humility, acknowledge it and rise again and step back into the, the spiritual battle. Number 188. Oh, Walter uh, put the image up there for us, for those of uh, you who can see it in your chat. Uh, that's the image, at least in part. You can see all the monks in the background. The full image, if you click on it, will we'll show it. Number 188. It is the privilege of the perfect to know unerringly whether a thought in the soul comes from their own consciousness or from God or from the demons. For the demons do not at first suggest everything that is repugnant. This is indeed a dark problem and hard to solve. So our thoughts either come from ourselves or from God or from the demons. And part of discernment uh, is this greater capacity uh, to see the origin of, of the thoughts and where they're coming from. But even for a person who's approached perfection, uh, it's still often very difficult to discern. And I think this is why uh, a, a kind of constant watchfulness and vigilance is stressed that every thought is going to be, as St. Paul tells us, taken captive, and we bring it into the light. We bring it to Christ for his blessing or judgment, uh, because at times we can't be certain if a thought is inspired by God or if it's inspired by the demons, precisely for the reason that he says here, that sometimes the demons aren't just going to put repugnant things before us. They can put things, religious ideas before us that seem like they would be good pursuits or things that would be good for us to embrace in the spiritual life that could then derail us, lead us into pride, or be something that's just overwhelming for us that we aren't prepared for yet in the spiritual life, a kind of discipline that they encourage us to take up. Anthony writes, do you have any comments on discerning the origin of thoughts without playing with the thoughts? Yeah, it's a, a difficult thing. Uh, because I think the, the safer path for us is to acknowledge what John is saying here. That it's very hard and it's a dark problem. And we see in the desert monks in particular, the revelation of thoughts as being something that's important, that they would go to their elder and reveal to him their thoughts throughout the course of the day so that he could look at them and see the patterns, the movements of their hearts and give them counsel. And I think this same sort of pattern of humility uh, in dealing with our thoughts is a good thing, especially when it has to do with weighty matters that we would bring things certainly before God in our prayer, uh, but we would bring them to confession when there's a kind of uncertainty. Uh, to lay them uh, before our confessor, uh, so to bring them to the light. Uh, because sometimes there will even be things that are very good that we will hold on to with a greater fierceness because it seems inspired by God. And so when anyone or anything seems to contradict that, we can dig in our heels. Uh, and so it's important to have a kind of relationship with one spiritual director where you can freely and without filtering anything, freely lay, lay out everything that's coming into mind in order to uh, unpack it and see where it's coming from. I think when we try to do this on our own is where we are tripped up often in the spiritual life. And so, you know, even if you're, say a priest or a monk and you do spiritual direction for you know you know dozens and dozens of people that you still are in direction yourself over the course of your whole lifetime uh 
because when it comes to oneself and one's own thoughts, it's very difficult to be objective uh, and to be as honest with ourselves as we would need to be. And uh, we, we really, I think, need to uh, hold on to that uh, because what John is not uh, exaggerating here when he says it's a dark problem uh, because we don't see all ends uh, of things, of circumstances, what's going on. Uh, at times, it's hard for us to step back and try to imagine what is going on with the other person, what their experience is like, and what's giving rise to what they're saying and doing, what's driving their actions or their words. And so having someone who's not touched by that on an emotional level or experiencing the consequence of it can be very important uh, to help us, as Anthony says here, to discern the origin of them. Uh, you know, is this something that's coming from God or is it coming from some other spirit? And um, I think in our day and age, you know, we, we follow often our emotion and we will use words like discernment or uh, where we, we are actually following our own private judgment uh, and the use of our own reason. Whereas we've seen here with discernment among the fathers, it's really seeking to serve the, the providence of God, what he wills in any given moment. And that might not be in accord with our judgment or reason at all, or what seems to to bring joy to us in the particular moment. And so having somebody guide us through that uh, can be essential. Okay. All right. Number 189. The body is enlightened by its two corporeal eyes, but the visual, but, but in visual and spiritual discernment, the eyes of the heart are illumined. This, again, is a key thought among the, the fathers, the, the noose, the eye or the eyes of the heart, that this is what we are, this is the immediate goal of the spiritual life, to purify the noose, to free oneself from the passions, to pray, to seek out the grace of God, so that there is no impediment that blinds us uh, to the truth about ourselves or the uh, realities of the kingdom uh, or of God himself, uh, that we're able to see uh, the path that God sets before us. And uh, if you remember before, we talked about infatuation being our struggle, infatuous, false light. So many things present themselves to us uh, in, in this life as being exactly that, a false light. They seem to hold out a path for us that will bring warmth, comfort, uh, company of others. But in the end, we can find ourselves in greater and greater darkness, uh, spiritually speaking. And, uh, and so again, pure, purity of heart is always being the immediate goal. And Cassian, when we get back to him someday, he's one who wrote very well about this from the very beginning of his text the conferences. So this brings us to a brief summary of all the aforementioned. And so just a brief six page summary of everything that we've talked about. And so the form changes here in a dramatic way, uh, which makes one wonder, you know, was this something that John uh, added as an afterthought because of the uh, the depth of everything that he has spoken about, because the the form of it is very much like the what you would find within the philokalia, uh, sort of these short short sayings about the spiritual life or various aspects of it, and he uses it in particular to summarize. Uh, but it's so different from the rest of his writing that uh, one is uh, led to speculate, perhaps it has to do with the significance of discernment for the spiritual life, that he really wants to make sure that we have a firm grasp upon what we've looked at so far. So be patient here. 
with me and with John in particular. Number one, firm faith is the mother of renunciation. The opposite of it is of this is self-evident. So the the deeper our faith becomes, uh, the more we are going to be willing to renounce our attachment to the things of the world or that have a hold on us. So the, the deeper uh, our faith and the more clearly we see the, the beauty of virtue, the love of God, his compassion, uh, these are things that lead us more freely to let go of our attachment to the things of the world. And the opposite, he says, would be is clear to us. The, the weaker our faith, the more that we are going to cling to the things of this world, uh, thinking that they are going to promise life. Number two, unwavering hope is the door to detachment. The opposite of this is self-evident. So unwavering hope, um, hope in the promises of God. We, we know what Christ has told us about the life that is, has been made possible through him. Uh, the gift of the spirit, his gift of himself to us in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, forgiveness offered to the contrite of heart, uh, our hope in all the things that he's promised to us uh, and promised to those who are faithful is what then, again, allows us uh, a greater freedom uh, in detachment uh, of letting go of things in fuller measure and clinging to God alone. Love of God is the foundation of exile. The opposite is self-evident. So exile, you know, the son of man had nowhere to lay his head. And to embrace his path, to follow this master, means that within this world, we aren't going to find much comfort or acceptance. Uh, and so we might find ourselves marginalized at certain points in our life because of our faith and what we what we believe in uh, especially if we are living it fully and we we aren't hiding it that we might find ourselves uh pushed out of certain groups uh or persecuted for one reason or another certainly there are many places throughout the world where that is already true and so our our love of god leads then to a willingness to accept this, that we might not have the comfort of home and family and friends at times in our life, but uh, experience kind of isolation because of our faith and exile. And um, it's important to be able to see this, uh, I think, because especially in the West, we seem to have worked ever so hard to uh, fit in with the culture. Uh, to show that we have this capacity to, to uh, blend in with the rest of, of the world around us. And I think that's come at a cost. It, it often waters down the faith or weakens this kind of evangelical spirit of bearing witness to the gospel fully. And uh, when we see that there's something to be gained from treading lightly, and uh, so our love of God gives us a kind of freedom in that, in that regard, that we can step forward realizing that it may come at great cost. And when we look at his sending out of the disciples, I think he wanted them to understand that right from the beginning. He purposely sends them out with nothing, if you remember, so that they might understand that they have to cling to the gifts that he provides and trust that he's going to sustain them. And so not to take extra things with them and not to be resent, resentful uh, when they uh, you know, find themselves and their message rejected, they're to wipe the dust from their feet and move on. And uh, so he wants them to understand you, you, your message is not going to be embraced uh, everywhere you go. In fact, just the opposite. Obedience is born of self-condemnation and desire for health. So the obedience 
uh, is born by our desire uh, to live in the fullness of the truth and to loosen the hold, the grip that the passions have upon us. So this desire for health, health that we place ourselves under the, re the responsibility, the guidance of another. And we, we do that freely, acknowledging our capacity for sin and our need for guidance. And especially our need to let go of, of our willfulness. And uh, so these two things give, give rise then to obedience. Abstinence is the mother of health. Uh, again, you know, this is sort of countercultural, although in some ways people seem to be embracing it for their own, you know, own reasons now in our own day, but giving up certain foods, abstaining from uh, that which is rich, uh, heavy, not eating a lot, you know, trying to to get a hold of that appetite, this is what brings health spiritually, not physically, is, is not what they're talking about, but spiritually, that we gain uh, control over and humble a bodily appetite that then gives us greater control over gluttony, lust, and other appetites that are tied uh, to, to our bodily hungers and brings them into order. So it brings us to, to good spiritual health. I think a lot of people today are engaging in fasting and all different kinds of things for kind of bodily health. And certainly that's good enough. That's good in its, you know, for its own reasons, but it's not what John is talking about here. It's spiritual health. The mother of abstinence is the thought of death and the firm remembrance of the Lord's gall and vinegar. So when we struggle with something like abstinence, from certain foods, the remembrance of death, of our own mortality. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, that, uh, that we realize that the fullness of life comes through living in Christ, and that he is the bread of life, that God has given us himself to nourish ourselves upon, himself to nourish ourselves upon. And so we remember our death, and the brevity of our life, but we also call to mind uh, the Lord's gall and vinegar, that there was no comfort given to him uh, at the end of his life, that there was a kind of bitterness uh, with which he experiences this life when, when crucified. And so we, in a sense, are to crucify the flesh die to self, to self-will, to the, the need to satisfy all of our appetites in order to live more fully for God, but also to foster this hunger and desire for him. You know, the more that we bring those bodily desires into order, then we can see behind them uh, our desire for God. The helper and foundation of chastity is stillness. The quenching of fleshly burning is fasting. The adversary of evil and shameful thoughts is a contrite spirit. So interesting, isn't it? The, the helper and foundation of chastity is stillness, rightly ordered love. So we still the mind and the heart and direct the thoughts toward God. So it's not s simply silence that's empty. It's a recognition that that silence is filled, filled with the love of God. And we move from the multiplicity of thought to simplicity, which keeps our mind from wandering or be being taken hold of uh, by our passions or the thoughts that the demons would put before us. And uh, so again, fostering silence and stillness is important for us. You know, again, the frenetic pace that we engage in in this life agitates the heart. And when the heart becomes agitated, we begin to look for ways to self-soothe, to comfort the mind and to ease that agitation. And so 
that then leads us into a kind of uh, distraction and the thoughts begin to wander. And the next thing you know, uh, they're leading us where we don't want to go. Anthony writes, that makes sense since Eros is a seeking inquisitive movement, right? And if we are in the stillness seeking God, then the, uh, the mind and the thoughts are less likely to wander. The clenching of fleshly burning is fasting. So uh, if you remember again, the miracle of the, the young boy who's throwing himself down, sort of in kind of seizures in this fire to water and uh, the apostles aren't able to heal him. And when they question him afterwards, he says, such things are over, only overcome by much prayer and fasting, the humbling of the mind and the body. So when we experience a kind of burning, when we're overcome by the passions uh, and afflicted and cast down by them, uh, it's fasting, the humbling of the body uh, that weakens uh, the, the passions and the desires, but also redirects them toward God. And as we've talked about before, Christ helps us in this by redefining the the goal of fasting that it's not only penitential uh but it is directed towards him personally that uh when questioned about fasting and why his disciples didn't fast uh, if you remember he says they have the bridegroom with them but when the bridegroom is taken away then they will fast so fasting from that moment on becomes a reflection of our desire, our hunger for Christ and what he alone can offer. He is the bread of life. He is love. And so the heart's longing uh, for him is what is going to lead us to fast and to love fasting because it redirects our desire toward God. It creates that deeper hunger within us. And so uh, it can't be a question uh, if we fast. I mean, it has to be a given reality for us that this is a regular part of our spiritual discipline, not episodic. The adversary of evil and shameful thoughts is a contrite spirit. So compunction, uh, sorrow, uh, for our sin, a spirit of repentance that redirects us toward God. Uh, this is the strongest adversary against uh, evil or shameful thoughts uh, because we cannot often uproot them or overcome them on our own. It's only in our turning to God, bringing them to the light, but also first and foremost, seeking his grace that gives us then the capacity to overcome them. And uh, the fathers, as you remember, uh, give us the, the most powerful, but also the uh, fastest way to do that, to turn the mind and the heart to God through these, uh, these short uh, prayers, uh, most especially the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me a sinner, to redirect the thoughts in an instant toward God is the, the most powerful way to overcome the adversary, not to wrestle with the thoughts. Remember the coward is the victor in these battles. And so to turning, turn to Christ. Faith and exile are the death of cupidity. And so when these reach their full measure, you know, when we have this depth of faith, uh, but where, where we've let go of all things in this world and the comforts of this world, then uh, we aren't going to be focused upon uh, the appetites of the body. And it's interesting, he says, but compassion and love betray the body. You know, when we hamper the self or we become overly focused upon the self and, and physical health, is where we then uh, betray ourselves, that uh, we, we have to uh, 
to gain self-control, uh, we have to do a kind of violence to the self, uh, not in harming ourselves, but in, in not giving way to our appetites and not pampering ourselves. And so in the desert, you know, they didn't go there again, just for endurance or to prove that they had this capacity to endure, endure hardship. Uh, they, they went there for this reason, you know, that there they, they could uh, really engage in this spiritual battle by first removing themselves from so many of the things that lead us into temptation but also they, they, they knew that the, the, they would be pushed to these levels where the mind and the body would be, would be deeply humbled, that they would have to have very modest fare in what they would eat and even the amount that they would drink and uh, sleep as well. Uh, some of these monks uh, were known for living, uh, were called open air monks. They were known for even living out uh, without shelter. And so, you know, they knew very little in regards to bodily comfort. And again, you know, this isn't calling us, you know, to go camp out in the backyard every night, but it is calling us to uh, engage in the ascetic life, that we have to exercise our faith. And in order to, uh, to open ourselves up to the action of God's grace in the fullest capacity. Number eight, unflagging prayer is the ruin of despondency. Remembrance of the judgment is a means of fervor. So again, remembering our, the brevity of our life is going to be something that drives us on, that makes us run the race with the, as if you will, with a greater swiftness. But unflagging prayer is the ruin of despondency, uh, which tells us what we need to do when we find ourselves being overcome, when we're beaten down by life, either by our poverty or when we experience failures in our life or when we find ourselves being treated uh, by the world or others, even those within the church in a harsh way. The way to pull ourselves out of despondency is to have an unflagging prayer life, that we deepen our prayer, especially during those times, because it's then that we are drawn into the peace of Christ in fuller measure, and we regain that clarity. Part of our despondency is a, a loss of vision that takes place there when we find ourselves not being loved or respected, and uh, our emotion at that point can blind us to, again, what God has promised us, make us lose hope, but also weaken our faith. And so it's only in this unflagging kind of prayer that we enter into that relationship as deeply as we can in order that those two virtues uh, might, be, might be strengthened. There's a reason that they're called theological virtues because they have God as their end, faith, hope, and love. And, uh, and so these, above all, we are, are to pray for. And love especially, you know, our love for God would be unfaltering. Uh, number nine, love of indignity is a cure for anger. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, if you want to be cured of anger, lose that kind of sensitivity to the harshness of others, rebuke, being looked down upon, uh, to alter one's view of indignity. And part of this is keeping our eyes fixed upon Christ and Christ crucified, that here is the innocent one. Here is love incarnate, rejected by his own people, and ultimately uh, crucified. And uh, and when we can see this as leading to uh, the perfect expression of love for us, that we become. Uh, if you remember, 
uh, Paul saying that it's in and through his suffering that he is made perfect. It's the suffering that is endured that allows the, the love, the self-emptying love, to manifest itself with a perfect clarity. And we hear, we hear Christ himself say, you know, I've come to set the world on fire, and oh, oh how I, I wish it was already burning. You know, he longs for that moment where he's going to pour out his spirit fully upon the cross uh, in order to ignite the love and the faith of the world and to reveal the love of God uh, and the depth of that love with uh, a perfect clarity that he'll draw back the veil completely at that moment. He'll reveal the love, the mercy, the compassion of God completely when he breathes his last upon the cross. And so when we have all of this within the mind and, and, uh, and we begin to move from having it be merely notional, abstract for us, to becoming real, that when we, when we find ourselves being treated poorly, we thank God. When somebody treats us well, when there's a blessing, we thank God. So in either case, it's gratitude, but it's to form the mind and the heart to take hold of that as a blessing, not a curse, it can be a hard thing. Okay. Let's see, hymnody, compassion, and poverty are the suffocation of sorrow. Wow, isn't that interesting? So, you know, singing to God, we all know Augustine's uh, teaching on this. When one sings, one prays twice. Uh, but hymnody in particular, you know, ma making use of the Psalms often, but this calling out from this deeper part of ourselves, uh, expressing uh, our love for God or our need for him and for his mercy uh, from, from the depths uh, is something that overcomes sorrow. Compassion, so when we show mercy to others, then we receive that back a hundredfold for ourselves when we find ourselves uh, overcome by life and beaten down. And then poverty, uh, isn't it interesting? When we look at individuals like St. Francis of Assisi, there is a kind of freedom, but also a joy that comes from the embrace of, of the poverty of, of Christ. That uh, when one lets go of the things of this world, one takes hold of what is enduring. And when that takes place, one begins to experience a kind of an invincible joy. You know, when we take hold of the love of Christ, what is it that we could lose in this world that would diminish that? Uh, and so poverty frees us then from re reaching out and taking hold of what is lesser, what has less value, and leads us immediately to reach out towards Christ and to take hold of what he offers us. So again, you know, the gospel in an unvarnished fashion, it's doing what it should do, which is to turn our world upside down and our way of viewing things and looking at, at life. Where is true freedom, happiness, joy to be found? Where is life to be found? And, uh, you know, it, all of this calls to mind the Beatitudes, which do the same thing as well. But when we domesticate the gospel and when we uh, em embrace sort of a path of mediocrity, you know, where we allow ourselves certain things and make them of no consequence, then we are actually stripping ourselves or losing that capacity to know the joy of the kingdom and never tasting it, then we have nothing to drive us on. Uh, St. Nikolai, one of my favorites, Lisa posted here, care most of all for your soul, brother, it is your only treasure. 
everything else you own doesn't really belong to you. That's right. And everything else uh, returns to dust. And having that clearly before our minds, again, leads to a kind of freedom for us. Number 10, detachment from things of the senses is divine vision of spiritual things. So once we let go of those things, the field of our spiritual vision is unimpeded. And we begin to see the things of the kingdom with a greater clarity. Again, the love, the mercy, the compassion of God, the life that is offered to us, but also the capacity to love others with greater freedom and the joy that that, that brings. You know, often we are weighed down by our own poverty and our resentments at times can prevent us from f experiencing the joy uh, that would otherwise be ours. Number 11, silence and stillness are the foes of vainglory. And if you're amongst people, seek dishonor. So silence and stillness prevents us from putting ourselves to the forefront. And, you know, this is hard for us in our generation because we have something called Facebook <laughs> where we're putting our face out there constantly as well as, you know, revealing sort of every thought that we have about everything. And so we are, are putting ourselves out there constantly and this can foster a vainglory. We, we want to be seen in a, in a positive light uh, through the things that we post and how many, you know, how many likes we, we get. And uh, so to move to a more hidden life, uh, I don't know about you, but I've thought about going off of, and I've gone off of Facebook a hundred times and I'm usually off a couple of days and I'm right back on. And because there's something that has this incredible grip, because it, it gives us in our day a sense of connection with others. Uh, and so th there's this good part of it that's mixed in with it. But uh, when it absorbs us, then it can give way to this vainglory. So uh, the silence and the stillness we have to foster almost has to be greater now so that we really are aware of what's going on within our hearts what's driving us what's making us reach for the phone again you know whether it's to check our email or to look at facebook to see what's going on or how people are responding and then he says also to seek dishonor uh not to prize the image that others have of us or the image that we have of ourselves, uh, but rather seek the kingdom above all things, seek the kingdom first, and to seek to be in a right relationship with God, to be seen by him, uh, and uh, to know what that means for us, the peace that that brings. Uh, Rod writes, uh, I go on Facebook every day to see what you have posted, Father. Oh, great. Blame it all on me. Go ahead. Lay it all <laughs> on me. You know, I wonder about this sometimes because I love the fathers. And, you know, and that's typically what I post. Every once in a while, I'll post like a cabin in the woods or something funny. But I, I go on and post these things. But sometimes I worry about it because it's stepping into this kind of cons consumerist approach to life and spiritual realities and information. I'm putting out these bits of information about what the fathers write. And there's a kind of risk in that because sometimes these things can really be nourishing. Believe me, I've had hundreds of people say that. It's like their daily Lexio, or it's exactly what they needed to hear that day. Uh, and so it can be nourishing, but it also can feed into 
a curiosity uh, in our culture or this desire to have things in little bits rather than delving into these uh, readings in such a way that we are not nibbling at them, but really seeking to nourish ourselves on them and allowing them to ch challenge us and, and redirect our lives towards Christ. And so I battle with that because the church tells us that we should be using social media, but in a good way that we should make use of, of this way of communicating in our generation. But, uh, you know, we're not impervious to it. Uh, one person wrote here that it's, uh, it's, in general, it's an addiction and it's made to be addictive. They create it in such a way to draw you back to it as frequently as they, as they can. Uh, so they're, they're selling something, in other words. And, uh, and so we have, to be, we have to be very thoughtful about how we do this. Uh, you know, a long time ago, I started stopped arguing or engaging in any discussion with people. I don't know if even comment on my own post half the time when people ask questions about it because of the worry about that it is going to devolve just into this agitated kind of conversation and, and take away the stillness of heart from myself as well as from others. And uh, uh, so I don't know. I agonize about this, so pray for me about it. I'm I'm still I'm still on the fence <laughs> about it because sometimes I'll tell myself, oh, you know, you have your Podbean site, maybe just post the the podcast and let it be. And uh, but that would require a Herculean strength for me to do, to do that. I don't I don't know. I'd really I don't have to pray a lot about that. Okay. Thanks, Art. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Uh, number 12. Visible pride is cured by grim conditions, but invisible pride can be healed only by him who before the ages is invisible. So a visible pride in us can be overcome when we find ourselves going through certain circumstances that are difficult and challenging for us. You know, when we become the focal point of others' anger or resentment or rejection, or perhaps where we experience upheavals in our life or health issues, things like this, uh, they humble us very quickly. They show us the fragility of our life, uh, but they often show us how quickly uh, things can change, that the human mind and affections are ever so changeable. So the person who loved you yesterday could hate you today. And so uh, grim conditions, uh, you know, experiencing those really can uproot pride quickly. Um, you know, I, I found myself, I don't I think was going to Jeremiah uh, recently, it said, trust no man only God. And often life really makes that painfully clear. Uh, not that we want to become jaded uh, and lose the capacity to love, but I think the human heart, Jeremiah also says, is a treacherous thing. Uh, you know, who can trust it? And it's part of that changeability that we have to be aware of, that God is an eternal rock. And we only find stability by resting upon him. Uh, that's Isaiah. Sometimes it's everlasting rock it is used in translation. It's one of my favorite uh, passages, but it makes that clear. You know, we find that stability only in Christ. So that's uh, for visible pride. That's the cure. But for the invisible pride, Others can't see it. And so it's only God who searches the depths of the human mind and heart 
that can uproot it for us and know what is necessary to bring about healing for us. And so sometimes, as he says, these upheavals in our life can humble us, but there are certain uh, forms of pride that only God uh, through his providence can uproot by drawing us through certain experiences or illuminating things that we didn't see or that are so hidden in the recesses of our heart because we don't want to see them that he has to illuminate in his own way. Let's see, number 13. The deer is a destroyer of all visible snakes, but humility destroys spiritual ones. So uh, as, this is an interesting one. And David already writes here, I've read this before with the fathers. I think Isaac and I don't uh, understand the relationship between deer and snakes. Uh, it's a reference to the Psalms. Like, as a deer yearns for running water, when a, when a deer is stung by a serpent, uh, thirst develops and they run for the living they run for water uh, to cold their thirst and so when we are stung by sin by the serpent it's by running to living water to Christ that we we uh, are, are healed and he takes this in a, another step uh, further and saying that humility destroys the spiritual ones so the serpents that are deep within, it's only humility that's going to trample them and destroy them. So the reference is definitely here to the, the, the psalm and, uh, and uh, its trampling of, the, of snakes. So, well, we made it through 13 of the... Uh, little summaries here but uh nonetheless there's a lot to unpack there and hopefully it'll make it take deep root for us okay folks so next week no groups because i'll be on retreat in california and uh up in the mountains i'll be thinking of you when i'm out there in the morning and all this i see every star and feel that cool breeze and uh, no traffic noise. I'll, I'll remember you all in the big cities. Uh, but it'll, I'll just be Monday through Friday and then I'll be back. So we'll just miss this coming week and then we'll be back at it. And pray for me too, because I'm doing, doing a little retreat as well as taking it. We're discussing uh, Isaac the Syrians. If you want to follow along, we're for, uh, homily 42 and 72 on tribulation. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so if you want to read read those, that's what we'll be going over through the week. So pray, pray for me, if you will. Usually do about two meetings a day there when I'm there. Okay, so won't we close as always with our Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Bye.